are you in or not? You need to answer me now. Our team of emergency doctors and nurses have never faced a disaster of such a magnitude before. It was the worst earthquake in Nepal in nearly 100 years. There was nothing left. It was unrecognisable, just rubble. His arms were covered in blood. There were multiple lacerations. The case like this is urgent. People who went there were those who were prepared to rough it out, who were prepared to think out of the box, knowing that nothing would be predictable in a disaster environment. The real fear came when we could actually feel aftershocks. It's really a call of duty. Let's do it. Sometimes we have to do something even though it's difficult. This was the most challenging mission that SGH had to undertake over the last nearly 30 years. Since the 2015 Nepal earthquake, Professor Anand Tharaman and his team from the Singapore General Hospital have been training Nepalese healthcare experts in disaster medicine once every two months. I want the decontamination ready within five minutes. In this session, 30 of Nepal's leading doctors are learning how to respond to a chemical attack. Some of the doctors in Nepal have come to Singapore for training in special areas of skill. The training program that we created was to better ensure that their healthcare personnel are able to function effectively when disasters were to occur. There was a need for command, control, coordination of resources within the healthcare system in the country. Using a chemical agent monitor, these monitors can scan the patient looking for fixed chemicals, certain known chemicals. Anyone wanting to go into a disaster area on a disaster mission has to be prepared to work under extremely difficult circumstances. That was in 2015. emergency has been declared in Nepal after a massive earthquake. Huge damage in the densely populated Kathmandu Valley, leaving rescuers digging desperately with their hands. Latest official figures suggest almost 4,000 people were killed, a figure that is going to rise significantly. My duty phone is always with me, 24-7, and on the highest volume, and it rang Ministry of Health. They said, we'd like to activate the field medical team from SGH. You only have 24 hours to get it ready. I needed to calm myself down. You try to wake up, you try to register what has just happened. I'm strong-headed enough to pull everybody together. It was a great wake-up call. <laughs> when disaster strikes in Southeast Asia, Singapore's strategic geographical location makes it the first port of call. Singapore is just outside this ring of fire. So on almost all directions, we are protected by other land masses, and that buffers us against the effects of volcanic eruptions, of earthquakes, of tsunamis. We are a very small country, and the smallness endows us with some benefits. Our ability to organize, to get things done, to move people. I immediately called the team and get them ready. 
In the three days following the earthquake, the Singapore Air Force dispatched 182 soldiers, rescue personnel and emergency medics to Nepal as part of the overall Singapore Armed Forces mission. Deployed to one of 11 flights was SGH's team of seven specially selected doctors and nurses. I received a phone call from her. Are you in or not? You need to answer me now. I was quite surprised when I got a call. I thought it was a dream. It was a chance not to be missed as an emergency physician. I watched too much of the news report on the earthquake and every image just scares me very much. <laughs> More than a thousand people across four countries have been killed in a strong earthquake centered in Nepal. Many more are thought to be trapped in fallen ancient monuments and buildings. It's the worst tremor to hit the country in 80 years. Devastating scenes that we are finding out from Nepal, where a 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck near the capital city of Kathmandu. The devastating earthquake affected 8 million people and was felt as far as 2,400 kilometers away from the epicenter. With hundreds of aftershocks, the number of casualties continued to rise. It was one of the worst earthquakes to have occurred in Nepal in nearly 100 years. I cannot imagine the amount of damage that will bring. I was concerned that I would not be able to handle this. Disasters are very traumatic events. Time is a critical factor. It is important that if we can intervene as early as possible, we can save more lives. I couldn't just sit there watching the news. I knew I had to do something. So I reached out to the chairman of my hospital, Tantok Singh, requesting that I be sent on the mission with the Singapore team. I'm a Nepalese, and I thought that I would be able to help out because I knew the language. There were a number of challenges uh, right from the start. We only had four hours. We had to load the aircraft. We had to ensure that the aircraft was serviceable and ready for the flight. It was definitely challenging for me. Uh, it was the first time we deployed into Nepal, and it was my uh, first uh, humanitarian aid mission. I'm a scrub nurse in the orthopedics operating theatre. The team thinks that my expertise can actually help them if uh, any victims needed to fix a broken bone or amputation. I'm the only one with zero experience in the team. The rest of them has been to disaster missions. When I was about to leave Singapore, I've decided to go with an open heart and just take one step at a time. This is the chance. You take it. an emergency consultant in uh, Singapore General Hospital. All of us undergo training in disaster medicine. I'm not a surgeon or an emergency medicine doctor. I'm like a general internist. I have had experience in the emergency department, so I thought I would be able to help in any way. You know that you're near Nepal and you can see the Snow Peak Mountains. And then if you look close enough, you might be able to see it, the peak of Everest. The piloting aspect was challenging. There were a lot of traffic trying to get in and, and get out. We couldn't land because there were too many airplanes going into Nepal at the same time. The Charlie was running low on fuel. We actually had to hold above uh, the uh, Kamandu airspace for approximately two hours. We just kept looking out of the windows. It was unrecognisable, just rubble. It was a mixture of fear and dread of what I would find in Nepal. Because I was just waiting for the plane to land so that we could start work. Nepal itself was also located in a valley, which meant that the aircraft was required to perform a steep uh, rate of descent. 
It's not something that we face on a daily basis or not something that we were familiar with. The Singapore contingent joined 130 other medical teams from 36 countries who had responded to Nepal's appeal for humanitarian assistance. They brought with them more than 100 tons of much needed emergency equipment and medical supplies. When we finally landed, the airport was still intact and there were lots of planes everywhere. There were these huge planes full of relief material. It was very crowded. You can see international flights coming in, military flights, commercial flights, everyone is rushing. It was heartwarming to see everyone coming in to help. Part of me was very wary about how will all this help reach the people who need them. The whole stretch of roads, all the houses along there were destroyed. The effect was quite obvious. There's rubble everywhere. You started seeing collapsed buildings, people just sitting along the road. There were a lot of debris in the air. Along the way, we would actually see the houses, right? The roofs were on the floor. The team set up base and was immediately inundated with hundreds of patients. We have never faced a disaster of such a magnitude before. I don't think I'm prepared at all. I didn't know what to expect. This mission that we undertook was the most challenging mission that SGH had to undertake over the last nearly 30 years. While the rest of the Singaporean contingent were deployed to help with the international relief effort, 36 army personnel focused on finding a base in conjunction with the Nepalese authorities. After landing, we made a recce to determine which area was in the most need. And we came to a small town called Gokana at the beginning of the foothills of the Himalaya and an area which had a catchment of close to about 20,000 people. It's scattered in villages all over the hills. There was a small medical post there that was manned by one doctor. He was unlikely to be able to cope with the numbers that would come through this particular village. We're going to be embedded within the army team we got a bus to the town that we were going to help. So this is the bumpy car, right? <laughs> they had already arranged a place for the medical team to uh, be allocated. I was the national contingent commander for the whole entire Nepal disaster relief operations. When I received the medical team, everybody was very tense. The question they asked was, where will we be staying? So I showed to them, Sheraton. Wow, they were so happy, Sheraton. Oh, my English is not so good. It's not Sheraton, it's Sheraton. Six men to a ten. They came with a task to render assistance. Comfort is second. Welcome to Nepal. A lot of the buildings were half destroyed. It was unsafe to actually have any of our clinics within any building. We had an open area where we set up our tents. It was sited within the grounds of an ancient Hindu temple. After the army organised the medical tents, the doctors went to work. They expected to treat 300 patients a day, so it was vital to establish an efficient system from the get-go. There was one tent set up for triage, one for dispensing of medications, and another one for treatment there will be a triage area where we will have to group them in priority of their injury or their illness. There will be a pharmacy area where we will dispense medication for them. 
if they are badly injured, we will lead them to the treatment room. Within this area would be the treatment as well as the resuscitation area, where we could institute life-saving measures to any serious patients that come in. We function as one team. We all just took turns to see and then to treat the patients. And it was very fluid, so there wasn't like, you know, one person was fixed to a certain area. All of us came from different speciality background. It was Dr. Ranjana, whose specialty was in internal medicine. Dr. Gayatri was a resident in emergency medicine. And Audrey's training was as a scrub nurse. She spends her life in the operating theatre. With four out of five healthcare facilities destroyed in the Kathmandu Valley, and with one in five people in Gokhana injured, the Singaporean clinic became a lifeline. We will start the clinic at about seven. We run on the average 10 to 12 hours. There'll be villagers who will bring food and tea for us. Patients would be coming in non-stop. So the queue is never ending. So I heard a commotion in the tent. Then I saw this man, he was shouting in pain, just growling in pain. And his arms were covered in blood. He managed to cut his hand, and it was particularly deep cut. It was dirty. It was the kind of injury that, in Singapore, he would have had to undergo anesthesia and a surgery in the operating theatre. After ruling out nerve damage, Nurse Audrey and Colonel Dr Adrian had to suture the deep laceration to prevent loss of function and an infection from setting in. We understood that in a medical mission like this, sometimes conditions are less than ideal. And I knew exactly what I needed to do, but a surgeon cannot operate on his own. I decided to go ahead with it because I had the support of the SGH medical team. We saw that there were multiple lacerations. It's a challenging task to raise against the time. The people who went there were those who were prepared to work in difficult circumstances, who were prepared to rough it out, who were prepared to think out of the box, knowing that nothing would be predictable in a disaster environment. There were limited types of painkillers that we could use. He was shouting and struggling a lot. It's really a call of duty. We worked almost seamlessly with the SGH team. We cleaned out the wound properly. We ensured that there was no important structures that needed to be repaired. We stitched up the wound and sent him on his way. Every single person that you treat every single person that you speak to, you've touched that individual's life. By day five, the total death toll in Nepal stood at over 5,000 and counting. Behind this temple ran a small river. This river you know, that was also sacred. The people who died in the village and in the surrounding areas, they are brought here to be cremated. The death toll was so much that they actually had to burn the dead bodies along the river. That really hit me. It was very visceral. Over the days, we saw many children. There were children who were hanging around the clinic, curious to know who we were, and uh, engaging with us. 
Some of them are just very excited to see Singaporean doctors and nurses or the army. It was very heartwarming. And we learned about their aspirations for the future. Were they looking forward to going back to school? The babies and toddlers were crying, but most of the children were good-natured. They had a very strong front. Despite everything, they always still had a smile on their faces. Because of the lack of shelter and the cold nights, many of them started getting lots of upper respiratory tract infections. Then there were kids who also had uh, sustained injuries from the earthquake. A little boy came in with this fracture. He's probably a 10-year-old boy. He said he got injured in the earthquake. He's having pain. Then we, we examined his arm, realised that he actually had broken his wrist bone. He put together this cardboard and rubber band to immobilise his fracture arm. And I just thought that it was brilliant. I was quite amazed. It's been broken for a few days. Without access to an X-ray machine, Dr Gayathri needed to manipulate the bone back into place in order for the boy to avoid a lifelong deformity. We inserted an intravenous line so that we could give him strong pain medicine. That kind of knocked him out for a bit. He was very thankful that we relieved his pain and managed to put the broken bone back in place. Every day felt like a problem-solving day. It's an unfamiliar place when you just have to modify and find a solution along the way. Landslides caused by the earthquake destroyed mountain roads, blocked access, and left thousands in remote villages cut off from help they desperately needed. There were many parts of Nepal that were very badly affected during the earthquake. About 600,000 or so lost their homes. And many of these occurred in very remote areas. Over the days, we realised that there were a lot of other places that needed help, but they were all in remote places with limited accessibility. We realised that it was difficult for people to come in. And therefore, if we wanted to reach out, if we wanted to help more, we needed to go out. We've come here to help the most affected. Why don't we take a team out into the more affected villages? So we have decided to drive up to them. We carved out a portion of the medical supplies. The Nepalese army provided the transport, and the transport was in the form of a rugged four-wheel drive vehicle. In an attempt to reach people in need, the SGH doctors and the SAF team traversed through harsh, mountainous terrain. The roads were so rough that sometimes I feel like I'm going to puke anytime soon. The real fear came when we could actually feel like aftershocks. That was when I felt fear. Learning of people trapped in remote villages, the SGH doctors, together with the SAF team, made the decision to venture out into the hardest-hit rural areas in Nepal. The team identified four remote villages on the outskirts of Gokhana, including Sundarijal, 10 kilometers north of their base. The 2,500 people living there had not received any medical aid since the earthquake. The teams tried to access remote parts of the country. Building roads through difficult terrain is a challenge in any country, and this has been especially so in Nepal. And even roads, when they are built, are subject to landslides. And in those remote parts of the country, there was no system of medical teams going to the disaster site to provide assistance. They do not have a single national ambulance service in the country. People had to wait for assistance to come from outside, from elsewhere in the country, and from international medical teams. And that often took time, days, 
sometimes even weeks. We were allowed to take only a limited amount of supply. The SAS team actually prepared us for the worst. They told us that the roads are going to be rough and there might be landslides. It took us half a day to reach there. It may not be practical to set up a whole campsite for a day. We would actually set up the consultation table and area outside. We have to modify on the spot and think about how to create private areas so that we can examine patients. Sometimes it might involve using like wood and cloth and then just draping over a small area. And then we'd see whoever walked in. How can I help whoever needs the help? The medicine that was practiced out there in the villages is definitely very different. This is not something that most medical professionals are used to. So every day when they went up there, it was with the expectation to expect the unexpected. You see everyone from all wakes of life, from the community. You get a snapshot of what actually is happening within that area. Many people in Nepal do not even have access to good health care, to clean water. But what I think really affected some of the very poor was shelter. Because of the devastation and all their houses collapsing, they were left out in the open and hence they were affected by a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms and respiratory symptoms. Many of them came in with nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. I think what was challenging was none of us could actually speak Nepali, except for Dr. Ranjanan. The SGH team was prepared. One of the doctors was ethnically Nepalese as well. She could speak the language. When she was running the clinics, she could function, you know, completely independently without the use of a translator. They seem to be taking time to also register and let everything sink in about what had happened, the devastation. There was this lady, she was just looking very dazed and she really didn't seem to be able to process we tried to ask her what was happening. Her son had been killed in the earthquake. She couldn't really deal with the pain of the lost child. So many of them were, were traumatized by the earthquake. So I think more than the numbers, it was the load that each patient carried it was actually very heavy for all of us. Psychologically, we could have been a bit more prepared for the trip. There was a lot of mental impact of the earthquake. Many of them had lots of emotional trauma from losing loved ones. Many did say that they felt fortunate to be alive. I felt like I couldn't take care of the psychological needs of the people I was actually treating. This was uh, something new for a lot of us. I think we are so used to seeing people grieve when they lose a loved one, you know, in our profession. And this lady couldn't do that. She didn't have time. You know, life has to just go on. It affected me. The medical team was very determined that they want to offer the assistance as help, and there were really in, indeed a lot of a medical assistance required. To deploy a medical team out of a stable operating base into the mountainous area, what if the aftershock caused some casualties on the ground? That would be a nightmare for me. Being a military commander, I think the mission and the safety of the troops was always paramount. We felt like we can afford to send a team out to other places without compromising the safety of the team. So we set out to one of the villages further away. Having treated people stranded in the outskirts of Gokhana over the course of the week, the team decided to push further out into the mountains, regardless of the aftershocks that occurred every few hours. There's more work to be done, especially to reach out to 
people who are in the village. I distinctly remember the roads. There were these huge cracks with some landslides along the way. The roads were so rough that sometimes I feel like I'm going to puke anytime soon. The landscape, the geography, the topography of the place was definitely different. They drove on a bumpy road that was not tarred. They drove over rocks, they drove across streams. This is part of my job. Fear, I took a back seat. I was not there to be safe. For me, it didn't really matter whether I fell off the cliff and, you know, I was not there the next day. The real fear came when we could actually feel like aftershocks. Oh no, this is earthquake, no. That was when I felt fear. I didn't know what is going to happen. One of the rocks actually rolled down and nearly hit their vehicle. We were quite shocked. We didn't know what to do. Should we stop the mobile team, given that, you know, it's highly risky? Nepal has got some of the highest mountains in the world. It was impossible for the teams from SGH to reach certain villages because these roads had been disrupted. Tracks that were existing prior to the earthquake had been destroyed because of landslides. Was it worth the additional risk of sending out your teams out into the unknown? If something should happen, you will look back and regret that you didn't pull them back. My role is behind the scene, communicating what is happening there to the family members. So the parents naturally is quite anxious about it. My family and friends, they were all quite concerned. The team was unharmed, but with all routes blocked off or unsafe, they had no choice but to turn back. We could not reach areas that actually needed us. But at that moment, I realised that the safety of the team was a priority. By the time when we are back, it's about 8, 9 p.m. Every evening, there would be a debrief. Everybody would take turn to share. There were many emotions that ran through. We were looking at the map to see what were the places that were affected. Those who were still affected, we could not go to see. We were expecting to do more. It was a very dissatisfied and a very uneasy feeling. I don't think I felt that sad about a situation before. But I actually felt very affected and helpless. I felt I haven't done enough. Despite failing to reach remote villages in desperate need of help, the team continued its work back at the clinic in Gokhana, and one patient suddenly demanded all of the doctor's immediate attention. One of the more severe cases that we saw at the clinic was this lady who was crushed at her home. Dan was trapped underneath the rubble for over two hours before being rescued. It took her another nine days to finally seek medical attention at the clinic. Her condition was deteriorating. We exchanged ideas and said, hey, I wonder what's happening to this patient. Okay, how are we going to handle this case? This kind of case, we will group them as per highest priority. When the doctors examined Dan, along with head abrasions, they found she had dangerously low blood pressure and a rapidly increasing heart rate. As she'd been trapped under rubble, 
these symptoms corresponded with the downstream effects of the crush syndrome. In this condition, the crushed muscle results in the progressive release of a protein called myoglobin, and when coupled with low blood pressure, it could lead to fatal kidney failure. A case like this is urgent and severe. It would go straight to the resuscitation bay. Their heart rate or their pulse are affected and need to be attended immediately. Without rapid resuscitation using an intravenous 0.9% saline, her kidneys would not get enough oxygen and Dan would deteriorate further. After several hours of monitoring, Dan's vital signs began to improve. It's an example of exactly why we are there for, to be able to see somebody who was directly affected by the earthquake, treat her, and to see them walk out of your medical post better than when they first came in. On the 7th May, we received information from MOH that the team will be flying back from Nepal. Okay, after we leave, how will the hospital systems recover after such a massive disaster like this? And what impact would it have on the people? It made me realise that there's limited things that medicine can do. Helping them, this is only temporary. I feel like we haven't done enough. We need to do more. After 14 days, the total death toll stood at over 9,000. Nepal now faced a long and arduous journey ahead to rebuild its towns and villages and grieve for those who lost their lives. Towards the end of every mission, it becomes clearer and clearer uh, when it is time to go. Oh, I'm very proud of everyone of team. Everyone has really put in your A game. The Nepalese authorities expressed to us that they were thankful. However, it was time for the Nepalese themselves to take over the continued rescue as well as medical missions. Singapore is a small country. We go by the tens, 20, 30s. But we treated the most number of casualties, 3,000 casualties. That is almost 20% of the overall casualty treated and there were more than 30 countries deeper underground. A mission like this is very intense. You don't feel how tired you are until it is all over. And then you realise that you were just going on adrenaline. This would forever be a life-changing experience. The next time when I hear it on the news again, would I volunteer the same way I did? And the answer is yes. I think it is the same for each and every one of my team, each and every one who is in uniform or part of the SGH team. Why did we even volunteer? Why do people volunteer? Sometimes we have to do something even though it's difficult because there are other people in need. When we go and volunteer and we help out, we also help ourselves. When I went to Nepal, it helped me feel a sense of purpose. In whatever way people can help another person or another country in need, I think this is what humanity is all about. When the plane touched down, I feel happy and excited, like finally I can see my family. Wow, I didn't really expect such a reception. I didn't really feel that we deserved so much attention. While you are there, you don't hear very much about the reaction back home in Singapore. 
when I came back, I had three children then, and they were very happy to see me right, after being away for about one and a half weeks. It was a heartwarming, very heartwarming. That was the first time I saw the expression of affection from my girl. Girl hugged me and kissed me. Seldom happens at home. That's the kind of feeling that we have after you have completed a mission. You realise the tremendous support that you've had. I'm glad they came back very safe. Nobody injured. You could see the smile on their face when they saw their family members. Sharing the joy of uh, such a meaningful trip with the kids was just so evident. Immediately after the trip, I feel like we haven't done enough. In such a big disaster, there are a lot more problems that need to be tackled. There was no common system of organisation of hospitals. There was no system of medical teams going to the disaster site to provide assistance. Very few ambulances are able to reach the rural areas, and rural areas form the bulk of the country. There were over 20,000 injured in that earthquake. About 600,000 people who were left homeless. More than 9,000 people who died. We tried to look for ways where we could actually do more. You cannot go into a country and presume that you know what that country needs to best address their disaster response. You have to listen to them. We went to Nepal in 2017. We visited many hospitals. We listened to those who had worked in the midst of the earthquake, who had actually seen all the action. They saw the potential for improving the way disaster management was carried out in the country. We created training programs that addressed what we perceived were the needs of the people in Nepal. I came in contact with Professor Anantharam to run the training program in Nepal. With the help of Singapore General Hospital and then Tamasek Foundation International. We have one for 20 medical colleagues. Every year you tell how many doctors? 2,500 doctors a year. This was a team that had to be prepared to fit into someone else's shoes, look at things from another perspective, try to understand what if they were there on the spot in Nepal facing that disaster. What would they want done for themselves? How would they want to be rescued? If they were injured, what kind of disaster management system would they have wanted? There was a need for a public emergency ambulance system that could be put together at short notice in disasters. The concept and development need of a centralised ambulance system was a very integral part of the training. Professor Anand Tharaman's training programme led to the creation of Nepal's first ever centralised ambulance service. Fast-tracked in Kathmandu during the coronavirus pandemic, it is soon to be rolled out nationwide. It is very important to have a centralised ambulance service in any country. There should be a call centre which receives the call from anywhere in the country. So the nearest ambulance is dispatched immediately to receive the patient. It is run by the trained emergency medical technicians and the paramedics. It is adequately equipped with equipment like oxygen, emergency medicines, airway maintenance, and even they are able to do CPR. Since 2015, Singapore has provided more disaster response training to Nepal than any other country. Training was being given to the senior doctors, senior nurses, and hospital leaders. We had actually completed the training of 791 senior officers. They are scattered all over the country. We are sure that in the event of a future disaster, the Nepal healthcare system will be able to better organize their healthcare response, and the number of adverse consequences will be significantly less. Dinner, 
जिंदगी के के होने रे तर खबरे सारे जान पर्ने शायद During this whole mission, what struck me most was the resilience of the Nepali people. Despite all the destruction that has happened, people losing their homes, they all picked up really fast and started getting together and rebuilding their communities. We saw people getting married, ceremonies continuing. People just started building their shelter, getting on with life. Life still goes on despite all the tragedy and the devastation that people face. We just have to pick ourselves up and just move forward with whatever we have left. They have both the emotional and the physical resilience. While we were there to help them, in fact, they taught us a lot. They taught us the spirit of resilience that despite the hardships, they woke up every day, they went up their daily business, and they continued with their lives the best that they can. 